Alright people, don't forget to subscribe and hit the bell notification. That way you'll know when I upload the next video and you'll be supporting my channel. Follow me on Twitter. Every time I upload a new video, I'll be tweeting. Horus and Chats, Homosage Reacts, and this is History of England, The Hundred Years War, Extra History Part 1 by the channel Extra Credits. Yes, it's been a while since I did a history video, so I'm like, what the hell, let's do the Hundred Years War. This was, you know, came on my recommended feed, and I'm like, yeah, I always want to, you know, react to one of the Hundred Years War things. So I guess this is the first one. At stake on the English side was trade, the English role in Christendom, the king's land in France held by right for 150 years and the reputation and honor of the king on the French side, a unified country, national prestige, and the right of their monarch to his own throne. Yeah, okay. I guess there's going to be some claims claims here and there. This is my throne, this is my throne, and there's going to be war. I guess this all started with, uh, you know, obviously, uh, William the Conqueror, right? Uh, he basically came to England, conquered, and changed the tide of history. And become, bec because he was French, I guess, uh, there are many people that are going to come to England and claim how, you know, the, the, their, they own the throne or something like that because of their ancestral history or whatever. So let's watch this one. Remember, if you like my reaction, don't forget to like and subscribe so I know which type of videos to react to more. Check out the reaction today. There's a link in the description. Check out the cards. Check out the cards. Yeah, that's all good. About 18 months ago, James heard one of his favorite podcasters say he was making podcasting his full-time gig, and we've wanted to help out ever since. Coordinating our schedules was almost comically difficult, but now that Rob's brand new miniature member of his family has arrived, we're sending him on some much-needed paternity leave to bond with his daughter. Congrats, Rob! In his stead, please welcome David Crowther from the always excellent History of England podcast. David's going to be reading for this series, so you can get a sample of the dulcet and beautifully British tone of his voice. And after the app, be sure to go check out his podcast at the link in the description. So without further ado, take it away, David. Thank you very much, Matthew. Ahem. The Hundred Years' War. The pageants and tournaments of chivalry, knights in burnished armour, the English archer destroying the flower of French chivalry, the great battles of Crecy, Poitiers and Agincourt, or just a sign of the brutality of the Middle Ages, senseless warfare and destruction, the death of thousands in the mud of France for nothing more than the greed and ambition of kings. There's all of this and more in the Hundred Years' War. It's a story of courage, the clash of nations, a story of human endeavour and the timeless struggle for supremacy. Yet there's also another story here, the story of a war that helped define England. Her sense of herself, her language, her role in the world. The Hundred Years' War helped form a nation. Welcome to the Extra History of England. It's 1328. The new King of England is a young man called Edward III. But he's powerless because his mother's lover, a man named Roger Mortimer, had seized control of his throne. But Edward was a warrior and a leader of men. In 1330, at the age of only 17, he gathered some friends and by pale moonlight snuck into Mortimer's castle. He cut down the guards and seized Mortimer himself. The interloper was dragged through the jeering crowds of London, dragged to the gallows known as the Tyburn Tree, where countless traitors would die over the centuries and hung by the neck until dead. From that point, Edward was determined that England and his... I mean, come on, you can't just go to a, you know, king's, soon-to-be king's mother or something like that and just marry her and take the throne and obviously not get hung in the end, right? I mean, you can't just claim like that. But this is ridiculous, right? I, I get it that, you know, princes usually get treated differently from all the other people and get trained as soon as they start to get in their teens or whatever. But imagine being at 17 and doing all this shit. What were you doing when you were 17? This is ridiculous. <laughs> Royal court would be a shining example of culture to all Christendom. The court of the young king was a pageant of colour, music, tournaments and poetry. He surrounded himself with the enormously wealthy nobility and modelled his court on the glory of the ancient and mythical Camelot of King Arthur, a celebration of the cult of chivalry. But part of that cult was that the king would lead his nobles to war, wealth and glory. And while at times the nobility did strain against the king's authority, for the most part they were his natural allies, holding their lands from him and working with him to govern his kingdom and his people. 
And so, with his greatest nobles at his side, Edward did what he loved most and was born for. He led his nobility to war and crushed the Scots in battle. But then in 1337, Edward's world was threatened. The French were at the gates. Well, not the literal gates. Actually, it's a complex dynastic claim involving several hundred years of medieval inheritance, law and international politics. We should be able to cover that in just a few sentences. For centuries, the French and English royal dynasties had fought over land in France. In the blue corner, the French royal dynasty, the Valois. And in the red corner, the English royal dynasty, the Plantagenets. And the Valois king of France, King Philip VI of France, was determined to take the last of Edward's French lands away from him. Because medieval kingdoms didn't follow modern borders or rules. They were the property of a king and his nobles. English claims in France went all the way back to 1066, when yeah. a French noble called William the Bastard decided that he deserved more than the lands he held in Normandy. He made the most of a distant claim to the English throne, sailed across the Channel, beat up the English and became known to history as William the Conqueror. The old Anglo-Saxon landowners were swept away and England became the property of French-speaking lords. French was the language of the nobility, of literature, of the king's court. English was the language of the peasant and the serf. Fast forward a hundred years, and in 1150... Yeah, this is, <laughs> this is ridiculous, yeah. William the Conqueror basically arrived in England, conquered everything, right? And not just conquered and ruled it, basically it took all the lands from all the, all the nobles from England and gave it to the, you know, his French nobles, I guess. And just swept away all the Anglo-Saxons, like he said. And obviously that made, like he said, you know, the French being more of a noble language there. And you can see their effects even today, right? I mean, all the, you know, basically English went to Americas and, you know, all the, you know, English heritage people right now is mostly in US, right? So, <laughs> because of that, right now, French is shown as, you know, one of the, you know, I don't know, uh, more favored language. Like everybody thinks, you know, it's a really luxurious language to speak of or something like that in US and everywhere. Everywhere, sometimes somebody speaks French, you're like, oh, look at that, he's speaking French because of this. So effects of William the Conqueror even be felt today. This is ridiculous. Fifty-five. a young man called Henry became King Henry II of England. Henry came from Anjou in France, and so more French land was added to those holdings in Normandy that came from old Billy the Conch. Plus, Henry then married the Billy richest the heiress in Europe. <laughs> Always a good way of paying the bills. The powerful, cultured and intelligent Eleanor of Aquitaine. And she brought even more French land to the English crown. Henry and his successors, the Plantagenet royal family, now owned almost half of modern France. They spoke French, they loved France, they were French. If they had to choose between a croissant and a full English breakfast, it would be the croissant every time. But there's a catch. Most of these lands were in theory still owned by the kings of France. Like all medieval vassals, everyone with lands in France was supposed to kneel and pay homage to the Valois kings for them. In practice, though, the likes of Billy the Conk and Henry II were simply too powerful to be forced to do what the Valois told them to do. So they just paid lip service to the French king's theoretical rights and got on with the party. But over the centuries, bit by bit, <laughs> the Valois had used their rights to take back most of that land while weaker Plantagenets were on the English throne. By the time Edward III was born, most of those... Ooh, that, that's a good thing, right? Uh, you know, overall. That, first of all... Uh, what do you do when a king basically owns land in uh, some other country, right? And that uh, same uh, same country has rules that, you know, king basically owns on the land in a way that all the landowners use, has to kneel in front of the king. But now you're also the king of other country. You can't kneel in front of other king, right? It doesn't matter what law, law says. That is a weird thing. See, what happens is William the Conqueror did a bit did things a bit differently compared to others. When somebody in invades another country and takes over, he usually conquers and, you know, rule by himself and puts all the loyalists from their place, right, for wherever he is. Put the loyalists in charge, makes nobles and things like that. William the Conqueror basically act like a businessman or something like that. He was, uh, you know, he just went there, conquered everything and brought his own nobles from France and gave them the land. This created this weird, you know, uh, whole scenario where everybody can now have claim over things, right? Sort of French people can claim, oh, oh I have rights over this England because William the Conqueror was, you know, fr French. Now, in some English like, oh, I, I come from the dynasty of William the Conqueror and he was French, so I own some French land and back and forth can happen a lot. Usually things like this doesn't happen, but this was a very unique scenario.
whose lands had been successfully reclaimed by the French, leaving only a single province left in English hands, a place called Gascony. The Valois king, Philip VI, was determined to take that last province away from the Plantagenets and England. Philip had no doubt he could achieve this. After all, France was the most powerful and glorious country in all Christendom. It was one of the leading centres of culture and learning. Philip only counted as his equals the Pope and the Holy Roman Emperor, and that's it. England was just a small, damp and slightly grubby country somewhere in the North Sea. Oh, that's the French good nobility were the shining exemplar of chivalry, while the English nobility were not. Philip made trouble for Edward. He made an alliance with the Scots against the English, and then at his court in 1337, he formally confiscated Gascony. Edward tried to talk. Philip told him to talk to the hand. Edward told him to talk to the edge of his sword. He would defend his rights. The confiscation was not just an insult to Edward. It was also a threat to English merchants. England had two great sources of wealth. One was in the wine trade with Gascony. The Gascon merchants as well as the English hated the idea of losing the wine trade with England. Even more important, though, was the wool trade, with the county of Flanders in the modern-day Belgium. The textile industry was far and away the biggest industry in medieval Europe other than agriculture. No other industry was a fraction of its value, and the textile industry was dominated by the densely populated towns of northern Italy and Flanders. English wool fed that trade. English wool was the best in all Europe, finer, with longer strands making it easier to turn into yarn and creating the softest, strongest woolen cloth. Every year, thousands of huge wool sacks were sold to Flemish merchants, and every year, customs dues from the trade filled the English treasury. But the Count of Flanders was a subject of the French king, and now King Philip told Flanders they could no longer trade with the English. The Flemish were as horrified as the English. Without English wool, their industry would die and their people would starve. So, one Friday, in the bustling market square in Ghent in Flanders, the people gathered excitedly round. Yeah, that, <laughs> that, that, that is the reason why in today's basically global economy, whenever some issue happens, right, people do sanctions and shit. Nobody just say, oh, we're not going to trade with this country because that is not possible, especially in today's world, basically. Because they know as soon as they make some claim with any, you know, any of the major countries, they know, oh, that's it. It's a massive level of, you know, uh, f taxes and, you know, all the business is going to go away. Because all the countries kind of rely with each other. Some raw goods come from this country, and you know the other country makes up, you know all the different things with the raw goods and sell to the other country. All the trades are gonna go away if somebody just just said like I'm not gonna trade with this country. That's why people always tiptoe when it comes to global politics. I mean, there was a I don't know was it a John Oliver video? I don't know which video was just shown that how Apple makes its phone right. A battery come from God knows where in some places, then something comes from the Philippines or something. There are 15 or something different countries where all the raw materials come from, and then material gets made into a phone, and it's just ridiculous. And a wooden stage. It was covered with colourful pennants and flags. But they saw a new flag, the arms of England quartered with the royal arms of France, and they wondered what that could mean. A young, powerful <laughs> man stepped forward. His name, he declared, was King Edward III. He had been wrongfully banned from his lands in France and he would reclaim his right. The people cheered. But there was more. By the right of his French mother, he was claiming the there very throne of France itself. The Flemish cheered. The French giggled. War was now unstoppable. At stake on the English side was trade, the English role in Christendom, the king's lands in France held by right for 150 years and the reputation and honour of the king. On the French side, a unified country, national prestige, and the right of their monarch to his throne. So join us next time as these two great kings marshal their forces and the Hundred Years' War begins in earnest. Okay, so that's what I thought it was the other way around at the start of the video, that like some French are going to claim uh, the right to, I guess, England's throne, but it's not the other way around. So basically all this started with the William the Conqueror. This is this is why all the different Hundred Year War and all the wars happened between England and France. Because some kind of a claim that somebody makes with the other country for the land or the throne. Why? Because it all got mixed up. French, England all got mixed up after the William the Conqueror. This is ridiculous. I mean, what what's a third of the population or something like that can trace their you know blood to William the Conqueror or something like that in England, right? I'm pretty sure there was some stats like that. That is something. 
Robbie Ball, that was History of England, the 100 Years War, Extra History Part 1 by the channel Extra Credits. This was a good one. Uh, there are 200 years war, right? This is the first one. I guess there's going to be another 100. How the fuck that 100 years war? I can't even understand the concept. 100 fucking years. That's a long, long time. 10 years? 20 years? All right, 30 years? Oh, God. The war lasted for so long. I don't, I don't remember anything but war. 100 years? generation would get born and just you know even die after getting born just you know the war is still going on i mean same shit happened with the japan and i was surprised like 100 years war it was 150 or something right this is just <laughs> this is some next level shit the determination like okay war is still going but i guess around that time things you know there was no advantage of modern uh, modern technology so i guess 100 years war kind of is understandable with how things worked around there how everything happened in modern world with all the modern technology transportation and shit i mean imagine if world war lasted for 100 years i'm pretty sure 90 percent of the countries would have been destroyed by now right just because of how fast technology is Alright, well, if you like my reaction, don't forget to like, subscribe, check out the reaction I did. There's a link in the description. Check out the cards, check out the link cards, and yeah, I'll see you next time.